Amen. God is amazing. Amen. You ready? I, I think I am. I think I am. Glory to God. So I, I want to begin before I pray to remind you that tomorrow begins a significant point. It begins 40 days until our anniversary event. Are we ready, church? There are going to be thousands there. Amen. And we're excited that, uh, that uh, God is speaking to you, ministering to you, using you and I. And just it's, it's greater than just one person. It's a, a, a God happening. And I mean that in a very sincere way. I just want to know where I want to go here. Okay, let's try that one. And um, I actually know where I'm going. But anyways, somebody said, he doesn't know where he's going. He doesn't know what he's doing. Well, neither do you, but, but thank you for showing up here anyway. So we're both in the same kind of boat. Amen. I mean, we know in part, we prophesy in part, we do our best with the parts that we have. <laughs> but, uh, but August 12th is the start of something very powerful before I pray. And I was talking to Pastor Kuna last night before we went to bed, and, and, uh, and it's going to be a moment for the next 40 days to stir our faith, to establish faithfulness on our lives and to stay focused. And these are three keys that are going to be valuable to God doing a new thing. Say a new thing. By the way, I just want to say again, I really enjoyed last night the Gen 1. It was just amazing. I really did. It was just amazing. And, uh, but for those of you who may not know online or here present, at, it's a 40-year anniversary. Some of you are 40. It's like you think it's ancient. You think it's like prehistoric. It's not. But nevertheless, you know, it's, uh, it's much more significant than an event. It's the exiting of a biblical generation. It's an entering in. I keep hearing that again and again and again in my, in my spirit. I keep hearing that. Um, <clears throat> But to get there, it takes some preparation. Say preparation. And, uh, and it's not difficult. It's not difficult. The Bible is not difficult. Don't ever let anybody say that the Bible is difficult to follow. No, it's not. The person who's saying it probably is in difficulty. <laughs> you know, but it's a start of 40 days of faith and faithfulness and focus. And God's always considered 40 days or the number 40, as very transformative, very powerful. And I, wanna, I want you to, you may have heard this before, but it's good for you to kind of hear it. To kind of, because I, I, I want you, church, I'm going to come out with a big ask right now. I need you engaged. Okay, so that being said, let me try to unpack this thing as best I can. And, um, <clears throat> but it's spiritually significant. It's been talked about for a number of years with many ministers worldwide, globally. But when God wants to prepare someone or something, he, for his purposes, he, he uses, biblically, it's patterned 40 days. And I'm not going to go into the depth of this, just simply to mention, for example, Noah's life was transformed by 40 days of rain. And Moses' life was transformed by 40 days on Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lexi, for doing this. And the spies that went into Canaan land uh, were, were uh, transformed by 40 days in that promised land. The David was, life was transformed by Goliath's 40 days of his challenge to all of Israel's armies. Elijah was transformed when God gave him 40 days of strength with a single meal. That's pretty outstanding. That's a great meal plan. <laughs> And, you know, the city of Nineveh was transformed when God gave the people 40 days to change. Jesus himself was empowered by 40 days in the wilderness. That's coming out of, that's Matthew chapter 4, other verses as well. And the disciples were also transformed by 40 days of being with Jesus after his resurrection. So you can see the pattern. It's, all, it's not that you didn't hear this before. Uh, but the point is, God is about changing things. Taking us from the good place where we are to a place 
that maybe you've never dreamed that you could even get to a greater place. As I always said, and it didn't start with me, but you know, good is the enemy of great. You don't want to accept good or good enough when God has great things in store for you. Amen. So Romans 12, 2 says, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will know what God wants you to do. I want to help you to understand a couple of things. Let's see if we can, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to what he's sharing. And let me read something to you that I heard him ministering to this. When I'm in prayer, I hear him. And um, one of these days we'll get into what's called spirit-led prayer. That's not mystery at all. I pray pretty much what the Bible says, but then I'm always, I always have what I call an open ear, not a natural open ear, but just I'm always listening to what the Holy Spirit, especially when it comes to praying for our cities or praying for our churches or praying for our church plants or praying for you or, you know, I, I want to listen to what he wants me to, to focus in on because he knows you better than I know you and whatever and wherever you may be. Amen? But nevertheless, it says in, in um, Acts chapter 19, verse 9 and 10, from the Passion Translation, it reads, it says, One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a supernatural vision and said, Don't ever be afraid. Turn your neighbor and say, Did you hear that? Turn your other neighbor and say, Did you hear that? <laughs> Don't ever be afraid. God's talking to somebody right now. We got to get rid of the fear of anything. Doctors report what that person you think is going to say, you know, whatever. Don't ever be afraid. Speak the words that I give you and don't be intimidated. Say, I will not be intimidated. Turn your neighbor and say, did you hear that? Then he goes on and he, in verse 10, he says, because I am with you, no one will be able to hurt you. For there are many in this city whom I call my own. Can, can I have an amen? amen? And then in the message Bible, they all, any translation pretty much reads the same way. So it says, one night the master spoke to Paul in a dream. Keep it up and don't let anyone intimidate or silence you. Turn your neighbor and say, don't go silent. No matter what happens, I'm with you and no one is going to be able to hurt you. You have no idea how many people I have on my side in this city. That was all Paul needed to stick it out. Come on, someone, give the Lord a great big hand clap. That's all you need to hear. So it's obvious that the Holy, the Holy Spirit is ministering. Luke is the writer of the book of Acts. He's ministering to Paul. He's, and uh, Paul was under great persecution. Judaizers, the persecutors. And, um, and apparently this word came to him because he was either considering going silent, not speaking up, not being as vocal. And this is what I want to share with you. Because it's not just like, uh, this is something that's been prayed out, and I know it's in my spirit, and I think it's going to help you. When I say in my spirit, I mean in my heart. It's a, it's, it's a word for, for us here today. It's very simple. And, um, but in reading this, the, the Lord reminded me, which I now want to remind you, it reminded me that he told Paul to not be silent, but to speak up because... He was tempted to be silent and to speak up. Why? Because of persecution. Say persecution. Persecution comes from outside sources to stop you from doing what you ought to be doing. Like living for Jesus, loving people, winning the lost. Come on, somebody. Walking in love. Trying to fulfill, you know, all righteousness. And the Lord began to share with me 
um, not audibly, but he began to share with me. He said, too many people don't know, people meaning Christians, don't know the value or the importance of their voice. The value to which I have given them to speak. He says, when you speak, he reminded me, I can move. He says, your voice in prayer, your voice in proclamation, to decree a thing, your voice in praise gives me access and opportunity to move in on a situation. And when you stop and pull back a little, even if you're a young Christian, you'll realize, you know, our prayer life certainly is because of our fellowship with God. Certainly, no doubt about that. We pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. And, but it gives God access. And it's interesting all the way from the old to the new that the enemy always tries to intimidate the patriarchs of old. We see, also see this in the, the Gospels, not with Jesus, but with others. In the New Testament, that the enemy tries to threaten or persecute or accuse you to keep you from voicing, using your voice. He wants you to isolate, to crawl back into a corner, to think that, well, you know, because of what I've been through or what's been done to me, you know, I, I don't really have authority, which is a lie. Because in Christ Jesus, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Come on, somebody. And the Bible says, like in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I think it's the Living Bible, it says, when you pray, it moves the hands of God on this earth. And it's important that you understand three things in the next 40 days, because it's about preparing you and preparing what God wants to do through you. And again, it's your prayer, it's your proclamation, and it's also your praise. You see... The importance of your voice is really valued. Let me point out to you three simple little things. The Bible says it unleashes, your prayer life unleashes incredible power. The Bible says in James chapter 5, verse 16, the last part of it, in the Amplified Classic, it says that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman of God makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. Now, if the enemy, imagine you going through a, a hardship. Uh, maybe you missed it somewhere. That's what sin means, missed the mark. Maybe you missed it somewhere. And, and then all of a sudden, you feel all this condemnation or guilt, and you don't, what, what do you, what do we, I don't feel like praying. When you don't feel like praying, and prayer is the only thing that's going to, Loose you and set you free in the sense of this. It's not that other people can't pray for you. Yes, of course. That's uh, the value of life groups. It's the value of relationships. Amen? Okay, but the point is, if he can keep you silent because you don't feel you're worthy or you don't feel you should or you don't feel the moment to pray, if he can keep you silent, then the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous person, meaning a born-again person, will not make tremendous power available dynamic on your behalf. And that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to try to silence the church. He wants to silence you. You want a generation that's going to make some, a difference? Well, you're going to have to have a voice. If you want a generation that's really going to make a difference in the nations of the world, well, absolutely, you and I are qualified not because of the university you go to, the job that you currently have, your cultural, ethnic background, whatever it might be. It is because of the blood and it's because of the Holy Spirit and it's because of the word and it's because I'm here to tell you it's, it's his unconditional love for us. Amen? It's very powerful. But if the enemy can keep you, imagine... If he can keep you silent, there is no power. You may want it. He makes you feel unworthy. God never makes you feel unworthy. I'm going to say it again. God never makes you, religion will make you feel unworthy. Religion will put all kinds of laws on you and tell you you're not good enough to even show up at the doorpost. 
Well, not Jesus. Jesus, look at what the gospels. God, Jesus healed people who were crazy <laughs> in their lifestyle. I mean, he hurt a lot of people. He wanted them to understand how much he loved them. He wanted them to understand how much God loved them. And, and Philip one time said, you know, show us the Father and it will suffice us. And Jesus says to Philip, he says, have I not been with you all this time, Philip? And yet you do not know me. You know, Philip didn't quite get it like a lot of us. But Jesus came as a true expression of the love of the Father. And, and it's important that you and I understand how much God loves you. But imagine if he, can, if he can pin you. Let's just say you go through a situation and you feel you've missed the mark. And uh, in that moment or in that situation, whatever it is, I'm not here to get into one thing and not another. You know, the feelings, I'm just talking about feelings, not the reality, but the feelings is that you feel not good enough to pray, not worthy enough to pray. And then because you know what's, who's pounding you at that moment? The accuser of the brethren. Satan himself, the very one who lured you into the temptation or caused you in some way. The choice ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, take responsibility for your life. Amen. Just to mention this and I'll move on. Anything you enter into is because you entered into it. Okay? But the point is, you can also choose to get out of it. Come on, give the Lord a great big hand clap on that one. So, so, so all I'm saying, if you're going to be a healthy, growing, vibrant, fruitful Christian, take responsibility for your life. Don't play the blame game. Don't blame other people. Well, my girlfriend made you do it. Liar. My boyfriend made you do it. You double liar. <laughs> you know, whatever it is, my dog made me do it. Whatever, you know. And I realize that life has its pressures. I do understand that. And not every circumstance is the same. But at the end of the day, when you begin to realize that God's given you the choice. Okay, that being said, imagine here you go through something. And, and there's a scripture in the Bible. And I'm speaking now to Christians. Because the Christians are notorious for carrying what's called a sin consciousness. They're always thinking of the bad they're about to do. unless you have a really strongly renewed mind to the word of God. They're always like, if something goes wrong, oh, I must have done something wrong. I must be in some kind of secret sin. You know, I must, you know that's called sin consciousness. The Bible says the blood of Jesus cleanses you from a sin consciousness. You and I, in Christ, not because of you, ought to have what's called a righteousness conscious, which means you don't make yourself righteous, but he became sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made, you were made to be, through his blood, through the cross of Calvary, the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So what that means, young Christian, is that his blood cleanses you, forgives you, justifies you, reconciles you, his blood has redeemed you. You're not going to be perfect, but if the enemy can keep you silent, you'll never depend on what he has done for you already. He'll try to keep you feeling unworthy. And yet, my friends, we don't go to the throne of Jesus because we're worthy. Because we're in ourselves, we are not in him. And through his blood, yes, we are. And you have to be strong enough meaning confident in his word. See, that's why the Bible says we overcome the accuser, right? By the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Your testimony needs to be what you understand from the word his blood has always, already done for you. Oh, y'all didn't hear what I'm saying. Because if you don't get there, the enemy will have a heyday on your emotions. He'll say, you're not worthy enough to pray. Oh, no, no, you went too far. You knew you shouldn't have done that. You knew you shouldn't have done that, and you did it anyway. And then what do you say? Oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah, that's right. 
And then you don't go to your Bible because you don't what? Feel like going to your Bible. You don't pray because why? I don't feel like I'm worthy enough to pray. Or you just been like, I don't, I don't feel like I'm good enough to pray. Well, let me ask you a question. Since when were you good enough? You weren't saved because of your good works. To your neighbor say, did you hear that? It's not that you and I shouldn't do good deeds, of course. Just keep that in balance, okay? Some of you are like, ooh, license to go crazy. No, you don't need a license. Some of you already. Anyways, uh, but we're bringing you back by the blood. Amen? Okay, I'm trying to get somewhere. You're slowing me up. So it says in 1 John 1, 9, which you all know, but imagine you've done something, whatever it is. It doesn't make a difference what it is. In the kingdom of God, there's not white sins, brown sins, black sins, and really, really deep, 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 dark, purple, black sins. <laughs> sin is sin. And the only way you can get rid of sin, listen to me, the only way you can ever get rid of sin, the only way you can ever get rid of that guilt is to understand the power of the blood. There is no other way. Some people just bury their guilt, bury their shame, bury it but it makes you a really irritable, bitter person. Turn your neighbor and say, do you need prayer? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me help you now. So imagine you did something like, see, I'm getting there. And 1 John 1, 9 says, if you'll confess your sins, God is faithful. I would say faithful. faithful. Say, God is faithful. faithful. Say it again. Preach to your neighbor, tell him God is faithful. faithful. Tell somebody else, God is faithful. Close your eyes and say, God is faithful. Say it again, God is faithful. Oh, you got to get that. Bible says, if you confess your sins, I don't care what it is. You might care. See, if you care, it's because you have this compartmentalized way of thinking of how God views you. Hmm? That if you don't do something like really, really bad, you're still good with God. But if you do something that, and we pray you not, but you do something, whatever category, no, oh, I don't know. This is why you have to understand you and I are saved by his blood. Now watch. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of all sin and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Now, either you're going to believe that, but in those moments, and some of you maybe have been there, when you stumble and do something, whatever it is, whether it's having a scrap argument with your child or with your spouse or whatever, you don't feel that. And so he tries to get you back to your emotions. And God says, I need you to put your faith in my blood and what I did at the cross in the name of Jesus. Because it says, if he can get you to feel bad, you won't pray, you won't voice, you won't say, Father, forgive me and cleanse me. And if you're sincere, you're not trite about it, you're sincere, he does that instantly. I mean, instantly. I mean, just absolutely immediately. But see, if he can get you to feel bad about yourself, then you won't voice. If you won't voice for yourself, you certainly won't voice for others. There's no way you're going to pray for someone else if you don't have confidence in praying for yourself. Your confidence comes through what Jesus Christ has done. So I want you to understand he wants you to keep silent. We don't know the entire story of Paul the Apostle, but the Lord had to come in a vision to show him, do not keep silent, speak. But when it says speak, he's not just talking about preaching the word. Because the, the Lord spoke to me, um, where was it? That there's never, oh, here it is. No one has ever, 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 ever preached a producing fruitful gospel without prayer, 
without praise and without proclamation. Preaching, ministering one-on-one or from a pulpit doesn't start at the pulpit. It starts in your personal relationship with God. Amen? All right. So that being said, say, I will not be silent. The second area is, of course, when your voice also opens the door for God to move miraculously on your behalf. Galatians 3, 5 says, God who supplies the spirit and works miracles amongst us, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? He needs to hear your faith. When I bow my knee and I'm before the Lord, and it's not because it's a position. The position doesn't get God's attention. It's your heart that gets God's attention. Okay, so if you're on your knees, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It's a great way to worship God if you want. You can be flat on your face, whatever you can, you can, you can be snapped. The point is, it's not your position. It's your heart. And so, and so here you are. Imagine you don't feel like, he knows you don't feel like it. He knows that for whatever reasons, but you're going to do it anyway. Because you're in that moment, and it seems very practical, very unsupernatural, very unmiraculous. Well, but Father, and maybe you have to have your Bible open. Your word says that if I confess my sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive me of all my sins and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Lord, I'm going to believe this, even though I don't feel like I'm worthy of it. And then, and I ask you, and then I say whatever. And then I ask, Father, forgive me. And you know what? He doesn't ask for a laundry list. He doesn't ask for, you know, give me three years of penance. <laughs> you know, he instantly justifies you. You know what justification is? Just as you have never sinned. It doesn't make sense to the brain, but it sets the heart free. Amen? See, once you do that, the enemy can't shame you. So when shame tries to come up, what you gotta do is you gotta reject the shame. Reject all accusations. The adversary always wants to pin you down with something in the past that's already been covered by the blood. Are you with me? And it's important that you and I decree every day. I think it'd be very healthy in the next 40 days that you learn to make a declaration before God. You need to learn to say what God says about you and quit talking about how you feel about life. Because how you feel about life is never going to change your life. Amen? Yeah. So, for example, the other day I was having a situation. I think I put this in one of my... my, um, 52-day mini motivators, whatever it is, where Pastor Kun and I are doing uh, to keep us all encouraged. And the Lord showed me something. And, um, and I was asking the question, why is this going on? He, he didn't ask me. He didn't answer me why. He simply said, bless me. And the moment he said that, I understood that I did. I understood that he was referring to, there's many verses like that, but Psalms 103, verse 1 through 5. And I wasn't feeling it, like, yeah, you know, someone knew that. I wasn't feeling, wasn't in the moment. But, you know, and I was trying to like, kind of like to rev the engine. And all I heard, it, it almost was audible, bless me. I said, Shandai. <laughs> and, uh, and, and the verse is, bless the Lord, O my soul. It's what David said when he was speaking to himself. David said, bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. So I began to bless the Lord. I often do. I often thank God every day for what he has done, for what he has provided. I know it already, but it's good to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto his name. Come on, somebody. That's what it says in Psalms 92. 
I thank him every day. Lord, you have made me glad through your work. I will triumph in the works of your hands. Oh, Lord, how great are your works. But here in Psalms 103, it says, bless the Lord. So I began to bless the Lord. And I'm, I'm telling you, brother and sister, I did not have a microphone and it got loud. You know, my windows were going, <laughs> not really. But anyways, um, I began to bless the Lord because now I knew, listen to me, I knew that this was not just natural. I didn't know it. I mean, I should have known it. Like you should know a lot of things, right? But I didn't quite get it. Like sometimes you miss things because you're a bad person. But sometimes you're just like, I don't get it. And then he said, oh my gosh, it's spiritual. And uh I began to bless the Lord, and I began to bless the Lord. I began to, I bless the Lord, oh, my soul. And I began to talk. I said, bless the Lord, soul. Bless the Lord, soul. The soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. And I began to bless the Lord. You know, when your, your will doesn't want to get in gear, your emotions don't want to get in gear. Am I the only one? I guess I am. Anyways, your emotions want to get, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. And then I began to go down the, the list of five that it has. And says, um, who, and these are the benefits, who forgives all my iniquities. Well, there was no iniquities there. Who um, heals all my diseases. There's no disease that I knew about there. And then I kept going down. The next one, it says, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Ha! Sounding good. And then the next one is, who redeems your life from destruction. Well, there was nothing evident but then I got to number five, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Shandai, Shandai. I mean, I would have had a Pentecostal runaround, but I was in the car. Anyways, uh, some of you, instead of complaining and griping and criticizing and blaming, got to open your mouth in a different direction and start praising God. I mean, start praising God. I mean, start praising the Lord. I mean, start blessing the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. You know what? You'll give the devil a nervous itch so bad, he has to flee. Come on, somebody. There's something about you blessing God. He said, well, it doesn't make logical sense. Well, the Bible will never make logical, intellectual sense, but it sure will keep you free, child of God. It will keep you absolutely free. It'll keep your marriage together. It'll keep your body together. It'll keep your brain cells together. It'll keep your finances together. I mean, some of you just got to bless the Lord. When it come, bad news comes your way, say, I'm just going to bless the Lord right now and just have a Holy Ghost. <laughs> ah! Some of you are too calm. Anyways, um, but it's interesting, just because the Bible says, I don't wait for you to agree. I, I like that, Pastor. No, when I began to need an intervention in some form, and I, there isn't a day that I don't, I began to praise God out of faith. Not, not because I feel it, not because I'm in the moment. I'm feeling good, I'm feeling good, I'm feeling good. You know, that could have been because you just had some sugar. But I'm here to tell you that, you know, I begin to praise the Lord. You're going to hear. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I get too loud. Anyways, uh, <laughs> you know, you're going to hear bad news throughout your life. The worst thing you can do is open this beautiful voice that God gave you and make it a garbage can. You don't believe what they did to me. And they should know better than that. And who are they to look at me that way? And the list goes on. Look at all the pure people in the house. They, that's wonderful. Say, not in this house. You know why? Because there's deliverance in this house. <laughs> for you. Anyways, um, for all of us. But I want you to know this. There's not going to be a day as you and I are headed on our 40-day journey or headed towards any one of the promises of God or just living out our Christian walk that the enemy's not going to try to get you to blame someone else or to accuse you about something or to become that gossiper or that critic. That's nothing but poison on your lips. It will never, ever set you free. Because as long as you share, no matter what, how honest, I'm just being real with you. It's still poison. 
But I, the good news is that we can praise our way into power. We can praise our way into triumph. And that's why the enemy wants you silent. And there's some people in this room, the enemy has tried to keep silent because of things you've gone through. But I'm here to tell you you're coming out. I will not let you stay in the valley unless you want to. And I'm going to do everything. If I could, I would kick their to help you out. So I'm just going to have to believe God that you have ears to hear. And it says here, and the third thing, because your voice, say my voice, silence the enemy. My voice in prayer. My voice in proclamation. Every day I proclaim God's word. I establish God's word. I decree God's word. The Bible says in Job um, 22, 30, it says, decree a thing and it shall be established. I decree Psalms 91 every day of my life. Every day of my life. And if you know Psalms 91, it says that he'll surround you with his angels. And the way I drive, I need a bunch of them. <laughs> Woo, yeah. I mean, the way some of you drive, I need a bunch of them. The way we all drive, we need some angels. Come on, somebody. It's all good. See, when you can admit you just need God's help, your hands go up really quick. <laughs> Amen. When you think you got it all together, you're going to, hands, you're going to sit on your hands. Anyways, um, say not in this house. Some of you got to get free. Some of you are not as free as Jesus wants you to be. But the good news is he's the freedom giver. But I want you to understand because some of you have been here, but you didn't know what was going on. You're being accused with shame and guilt and this, that, and the other. Your voice is important. Your prayer life is important. Don't go silent. Don't isolate yourself. Number two, you've got to decree God's word. Often, you know, I start off my day uh, trying to sing <laughs> Psalms 100. <laughs> Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. That's why I like starting off with that one. Because it talks about noise. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All ye, all ye lands, serve the Lord, Lord with gladness. Come before his, praises, uh, his presence with singing. And then it goes on, the second week, it talks about enter into his course with thanksgiving. And, and it talks about how to enter in. So every day I try to start off my day that way. I'm helping you to understand your 40 days. And, and so I start, and I always thank him. I'm open, I'm not mechanical, I'm always thanking him. So many things to thank him, but I just thank him until I feel, you know, time to move on. And I begin to thank him. I begin to press him. I begin to praise him. Not because I'm going through something, just because, because he's worthy. And, and the beauty, as I said before, I don't know, this third service, I guess, maybe. The Bible says that you and I have the right to go into the holy of holies. Not because you deserve it but through his shed blood. The Bible says in Hebrews um, 10, 19 that we get to go into the Holy of Holies. I never go with my garments. I go covered in his blood. And I thank him. I said, Lord, I wouldn't even be redeemed from the curse of the law if it hadn't been for your blood. The Holy Spirit wouldn't even be active. I wouldn't even be born again if it wasn't for what you did at the cross of Calvary to set all humanity free, and I happen to be part of it. Thank you, Lord. However, however it goes. And, but then when I'm in the two things I always pretty much do on an everyday basis. I don't want to exaggerate, but I think it's pretty much every day. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, that you and I have, it says boldness, to go to the throne of grace, boldness simply means confidence, to have confidence. My confidence is not in Arch Sepulveda because I'm a pastor. My confidence is not in Arch Sepulveda because of my experience. My confidence is not because whatever. My confidence is in what he has done. And my confidence is my security. And so it will be yours. But it says uh, we have... Um, Right, to come boldly to the throne of grace or confidence, to, come to obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. 
I remember the other day I was saying this to the Lord. I said, Lord, there's not a day I live that I don't have need for your mercy and your grace. Because mercy is not getting what I deserve. Hmm? Right? See, if you get what you deserve, that's called justice. You don't want justice. That means you get the penalty for your sin. You want mercy. That means you don't get the penalty for your sin because he covered you. Come on, somebody. And then, it, but grace, coming to, come to his throne of grace, so you and I have access, is you and I receiving upon our lives the power and the work of the Holy Spirit that we did not earn, did not deserve, but he gives it to us anyway. But that, therefore, you know, the other day, the enemy tried to do something, and I just started doing what I'm going to ask you to do. There is a way that you can silence the enemy every time. <laughs> I'm serious. I don't know what that was. <laughs> I really don't. I really don't. But in Psalms chapter 8, verse 2, look, I have glasses. In Psalms chapter 8, verse 2, it says, you have built a stronghold by the songs. Anyone say songs of children. Strength, strength rises up into the chorus of infants. Say chorus. This kind of praise, say praise, has power. Say power. Look at that. This kind of praise has power to shut Satan's mouth. We're not talking about a song service here. Because people can have a mic and sing, have a beautiful voice and not have any praise in their heart. Don't ever be swayed by the beauty of a person's tone alone. I'm not saying it's not beautiful. But Jesus said, you worship me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. I wonder how many praise and worship leaders across America and the nations of the world, not to criticize, not to judge, but simply to make the statement. We're worshiping him this morning at, in their time zone, singing what you would think is the most beautiful song, but in their heart they were offended in unforgiveness, bitter, gossiping, complaining, not believing God's word, backbiting, that's not a true worshiper. But this kind of praise has power to shut Satan's mouth. Childlike worship will silence or muzzle the madness of those who oppose you. The only one who really opposes you is the adversary. You don't fight against flesh and blood. Amen? And I want you to understand something. That when you begin to praise God... When you begin to, and I'm not talking about a song service, there's nothing wrong. I love to see, last night at Gen 1, I love to see, I mean, I had to clear the first roll, but I would have got run over. But, um, and I just stood back there and I was watching, you know, as Rafi was leading and, and the rest, you know, were leading in worship and just, I just, generation just worshiping God and just like amazing and just incredible. Everyone amazing. And um, it's powerful. And I shared this with you because here's what I want you to understand over the next 40 days. The enemy will try to keep you silent. He'll try to whatever. This is where your faith in God, your faithfulness, no matter what season, you'll stay with it. And your focus will prepare you for what God wants to do in and through you, transform you. Because as we just read, Acts um, 18, verse 9 and 10, the Lord said, Paul, do not be silent, but speak. Then he goes on, know that, number one, I am with you. Say, God is with me. Mm -hmm. Think about it. God was with them when he was being persecuted and even when he wanted to give up, he had a vision. And God will continually speak into your life because he's with you. He will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He'll back you. He'll lift you. He'll strengthen you. Then he says, 
I will protect you. In other words, in, in that, uh, I think it's verse 10 of Acts 18. He says, no one will attack you to hurt you. But that's if you open your mouth. When you open your mouth, I will not stop praying. I will not stop interceding. I will not stop declaring. And I will not stop praising God. There is a supernatural. Say a super. Say super. There is one supernatural. No, sorry. There's, there's a. Su- <laughs> I'm sorry. That's Pastor Kuna coming rubbing off on me. Uh-huh. Oh, no, she's listening. And anyways, um, he said, I will protect you. And then it says, I have many people for you. I have many people for you. In other words, it says in the, in the particular verse, um, that's part of verse 10. I have many people in this city. You know, it might sound silly, but let me, let me kind of push it out and then get ready to close here. When I was praying this out, and, and honestly, I did not, like, this was not going to be the focus for this morning, but you were. And so I, I know this is a word in season for us. Watch. He shared with me. I can't, he was not audible, but he kind of like, it, I sensed. I said, Lord, what do you mean by you have many people in this city? Well, he says, oh, I have many people in this city that you don't even know about. And, he, and then I, I sense he was saying, I have a choir. I said, what? And so this is what I heard. It's not scripture, but this is what I heard. I have a citywide choir of intercessors, prayer warriors, ministers of the gospel, saying what I need said so that I can do what must be done. And it's important that you and I understand this. And so the Lord shared with me, come back to the simplicity in these 40 days. Your prayer life is important. Your praise life is important. And your proclamation saying what God says about you is important.